You are listening to a live message from Gold Street Garden Church with Dr. Dominic Butler. We are thrilled to have you join us for today's message. Our prayer is that you would see Jesus clearer than ever before and your desire to know him personally would increase in Jesus' name. Amen. For more information about the church, you can go to goldstreetgarden.com. Father, we just come before you tonight. We thank you that we have this amazing privilege. To bring ourselves as an offering to say thank you. Lord, I thank you that tonight that our that you would filter through our motives. That Lord, I, I just thank you that everybody under the sound of my voice, if they would no matter where they're at in their walk in life, I just pray that there would be an added weight to conviction tonight. That we would be willing to lay our hearts on the altar tonight and say, God, whatever is there that should not be, Lord, please reveal it to me so that I can run with, with greater endurance, so that I can run with purpose And that my purpose would be you. It wouldn't be anything besides just staying focused on you and Lord. I am not the teacher tonight. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Use me. And Father, I thank you that those that have ears to hear, that they would hear something tonight that would change the course of their life. Lord, I thank you that even I feel it in my spirit that there is even people that the decision to be here tonight is actually not just to be encouraged, not just to even hear a word or whatever, but there's actually people that came here tonight that this night will change the course of destiny, that literally, literally decisions are going to be made in the presence of God tonight that would not have been made without the investment. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty, precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. You guys excited? I'll tell you what. And you know, it's so funny. The whole time we're worshiping, I'm just like, I have my eyes on Jesus. And I'm like, the stage is prophesying. If you know what I mean, it was creaking. It was, <laughs> it was, like, it was like, the stage is prophesying to the Lord. I was like, he's just giving praises. <laughs> um, it was awesome. Hey, let the stage cry out. But one of the things that was so in my heart during worship that I wanted to bring up right before we get into the main message tonight was I was teaching at Bible College last night uh, at Life Christian University. Some of you know Dr. Douglas Wingate. He was actually here last week. He's the president of the school. I was teaching a class. And actually, Nick, who was just up here, he was my student. He was late, and I scolded him for it. (laughs) It was like class started. I'm like, you're late. I'm going to make sure you get suspended from this school. I have that authority. Um, But uh, one of the things that happened while we were there is I was teaching a class to all these students. And one of the things that um, came up is I asked a question. I just asked a question, and it just wasn't even necessarily part of what I was teaching. It just came up in my heart. I said, I said, does anybody know what the most important ministry is? Like, what is the most important ministry? And when I asked that, people st- actually started shouting things out. I was really surprised. I was like, oh, wow, they're bold. They really think they, they know what it is. And, uh, I, you know, and I didn't realize what the most important ministry was even until this past year. I probably would have said a couple different things. And somebody said prophecy. And I was like, prophecy is awesome. It's in the Bible. and We need it. We need to prophesy. And somebody else said something. And I said, the most important ministry is our ministry unto the Lord. And this is literally what was asked. What is that? And I was, it it was, uh, it blew my mind. It blew my mind that, that people that were actually coming to a Bible college didn't know what ministering to the Lord was. And why is that? Because we have taught people in American culture, church culture, that a ministry is all about people. And a lot of people would be like, well, what do you mean? If you minister to him, the people will get more accidentally healed 
They will get more accidentally taken care of if we keep this ministry at the forefront of our heart. But if you think about church nowadays, sometimes churches, it's all about people. It's all about how can we make the service accommodating to everybody in the family. And I'm not trying to say that we don't seek the Lord on how to do those things, but he has to be most important. Amen. Would we all agree that he, that he is the reason we would even gather? And tonight, the Lord, as we, we had our opening service last week, and it was a blast. And thank you to everybody that made that night so special. And thank you for coming out again as we go on this journey of seeing Clearwater shaken by the power of God. Like, see, I'm talking about, we, we're, I, I really want to make it a point that every time I get up here under the anointing that I want to prophesy and I want to declare over this city that it shall be saved, that, there, that we are going to see crime rate in Clearwater at an all-time low. We are going to see hospitals with their lowest attendance. We are going to see drug addicts get born again and turn into Billy Grahams and Reinhard Bunkies. We are going to see amazing things take place. But we got to speak it because if, if somebody doesn't get bold enough to declare something over a city, nobody's going to believe it, ever. The fact that I'm even getting up here and saying that, there's going to be one or two people, I want to believe the whole room, that will say, yeah, that can happen. God is that good. God is that great. And if we all come together as a body, we could see something like that happen. But it has to start with somebody speaking what they know to be true about who he is. Uh, we don't speak it because we're confident in who we are. We're, we're confident in who we are in him. And because of that, what he's done in my life, what I've seen him do in other people's lives, there's no reason he can't do it. In every, and we said it last week and want to say it again. We're believing for that woman at the well. We're believing for that, that, that man that was born blind. Because Jesus, he always went after the one. The crowds came to him, but he always went after the one. And he would go after the one, and that one would tra transform a city. But so many times we're like, well, what, how many big community events can we do? How many? And all oh, that's great. But I'll tell you what. It's going to be that one person that, that, that has major influence in the city of being a bad person or somebody that is a bad influence that gets rocked by the love of God gets knocked off the horse like Paul. Remember Paul? He thought he was doing all these things for God and just gets knocked off the horse. And next thing, he, he, his life literally, the, the things he was, he was killing people that were preaching Jesus and then he became the pioneer of it, like the leader of the, the band, the leader of the, like he was it and it all happened just because of a love encounter with Jesus. And just seeing him for who he really is. So that's, that's our prayer. That's what we're prophesying. And can, right before we get into the main message, can you get into agreement with me over the city? Can we pray and believe? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that clear water shall be saved. That clear water shall be the name, that the name that it has will be what it is, that there will be such purity in this city, that this will be a city that loves God, that people will come from all over the world to see what God is doing in this city. They will see the signs, wonders, and miracles. They will see them, and they will fall in love with Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty, precious name. Everyone said amen. Did you know the first sign of a believer? Remember, Jesus said that these signs shall follow those who believe. Do you know what the first sign is? Cast out demon. What if that was the requirement for you to be a part of the church? Have you cast a demon out yet? Because that's, that's the first sign. And the reason I say that is because I really believe we as believers really need to elevate ourselves to what the word says and walk in that and go after that with everything inside of us like wherever we see something in the word that we're not there yet don't get condemned or be like father teach me father me to get to that level speak to my heart show me the the adjustments that need to be made and what's going to take place tonight is i've been seeking the lord on what is the foundation that needs to be laid for this vision for what we're going on. And I, I've been, I told you guys, I was very transparent last week that I, in the natural, I have no clue what I'm doing. Like, I, it was funny, I was talking to Jackie uh, the, the other day, and I was just saying, if 
if, if I just think about what we're doing in the natural, you know, this would just drive me right up a wall. Like, this would be like, why am I doing this? Like, this is, but the thing is, is that there's something in my heart that is pulling me to go after this, to, to get here at 530 and set all these chairs up and set everything up and get things going. Like, who does that? Unless they're convinced that God wants to do something and that he's just looking for a group of people that are going to give him their yes. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And what I want to talk about tonight is purity. But specifically, the, the word that the Lord put in my heart tonight is purity, the key to see. And we're going to talk about purity of heart. And I want to lay a foundation tonight that, you know, we could talk about so many different things, right? When if you would have asked me like a year or two ago, if I were starting a church, what would be the first message I would preach? And I would be like, I would preach faith or I would preach grace. And, I, and all those things are so amazing. But there is so much that God wants to do in our hearts. And there is nothing more important for you to steward than the health of your heart. And I'm talking about the spiritual health of your heart. And every day you watch over this thing and you see where, it, where it's not taking you or where it is taking you. And I want to go through some, we're going to go through some major scripture tonight. Is that all right? Because it's, does everybody believe the word of God? Do you believe that it's not just a, a good instruction when you're feeling bad? That it's not just that, that you can find life in that book? And not only, but I want you to know that it's not only the life in the book, but there's something so important about you taking time to even shut everything down. And I'm talking every day, just even if it's just for a few minutes. And just go before the Lord and pray prayers like this. Lord, test my heart. Is there any wicked way in me? Like, pray the prayers that David prayed that kind of put you under a scope of his love and make yourself so vulnerable to whatever he would say or for whatever he would want to do in your life. Isn't it important that we, we take that type of inventory? Because it's easy to just go to God when we need something. That's really, I, that's really why people, pro, you know, the majority of people even prayer doesn't come up in people's minds, in Christians' minds sometimes, until a need pops up. But if you realize that you need him, prayer becomes unceasing. <laughs> because, because prayer that is only driven by need will not transform you. It won't change your life. Prayer that is only driven by need is the most shallow relationship you can have with God, but he's a good father, and he will even entertain and help you at a surface level, but there has to come a time where you say, God, can you use me to be an answer to someone else's prayer? Can you, could I be an answer to someone else's prayer and tell somebody that you love them today? Do you realize how, do, we don't even realize how much little things we can do throughout our day-to-day -day that can actually change somebody's life. Like simple things like going to Starbucks or going to uh, Dunkin' Donuts or just when you're going to get a coffee, they have those little tip things out there. Be purposeful and put a dollar in. Put, maybe, maybe one day the Lord puts it on your heart to throw a 20 in, but make sure you look them in the eyes and tell them, Jesus loves you and he wanted me to let you know that he's proud of you today. Like, do you know that's going to rock somebody? And all it takes is you to maybe look at somebody in the eyes and realize that they're a valuable soul to God. And all of a sudden, because as soon as you see value in someone, God will speak words to you, to that person. He just does because he sees you're willing to do that. Amen? Amen. So I want to go through a few scriptures. You want to, you ready to go on this journey with me? I mean, you already, uh, you already came out, got in your car, you came here. You might as well enjoy yourself for a little bit, right? <laughs> so uh, 
Let's do this. So purity, the key to see. If you guys could turn, if you all could turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is uh, where Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. You want to get some major correction from the Lord himself. Read those. See where your life's at. (laughs) I do it a lot. And I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you for that Holy Ghost whipping. I needed that. Um, But our our main verse for tonight, and we're going to go a few places, but I just want you to get your, your eyes on this verse, one of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 8. It said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's just stay right there. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, I don't know about you, but as I've grown in my walk with the Lord, when I read that scripture, the only thing I can think about is, Lord, help my vision and my heart to become more pure. Why? Because I want to see him more. Do you see that? You have to re- It's not just when you see a scripture like that, you're, it's like it's a challenge, It's saying that if you want to see more of God, the prerequisite is purity. But it's not purity on your own doing. It's not you striving to be pure. It's not this. It's a relationship with God that what happens is as you go deeper with him, the motives of your heart get filtered. And whatever is selfish, whatever is impure, begins to surface in the secret place. Because the secret place is a purging, purification. It's like, a, it's like a furnace when you really treat it the way it's supposed to be. The secret place is you get in the secret place, and if you get still before the Lord, all of a sudden God will say, I want that. That thing in your heart right there. Jackie and I, we're, we're very watchful in our relationship that if I notice, if I get like heated over something minuscule, like say she, she makes a comment and I react real quick, I, we have really helped each other to immediately be like, that's not supposed to be there. But we don't come at each other. We, we realize like, wow, that surfaced because there's impurity somewhere in here. And the reason we need to get after it is because our family wants to see God more not more feuds, not more who's right. We want to see him because if we can all see him more, everything else is going to fall into place. Amen? Isn't that what it's about? So the p- blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So Lord, whatever is in my heart that is causing me not to see clearly, I want it out. Reve- I give you permission in my day to day through relationships. Reveal it to me, God. Keep me on a short leash so that I can just stay enraptured by you. Amen? So with that being said, just stay right there. As we were worshiping tonight, it's so important we understand the value of a moment. Did you realize that every moment... We have choices that we can make in moments, and a a moment can either be consumed by agendas or it can be offered for his. Every moment can either be consumed by agendas or offered for his. A moment is an offering. And isn't it so, I would dare to say, I would go as far to say that the most lethal attack on purity is busyness. Purity is not compromised through just evil. I would say purity is compromised the most through busyness. And I want to show you why that is so true and how you have to keep such a a guard over that. I've, I've, I've learned in my walk that spiritual maturity is not learning I can do more. It's actually learning I'm not able to do anything without him. That's what spiritual maturity is. Spiritual maturity is not, oh, I can do more now because I'm growing in the Lord. It's actually, I realize, oh, I'm actually not able to do anything unless I'm completely dependent upon him. 
In fact, the visions that he's giving me, if I even try to do it myself, I'm going to end up in a straitjacket and in an insane asylum. Because he asked you to do crazy things beyond your ability because he wants you to see him. If you can do it on your own ability, you will not see him. You will just see yourself being a successful moral person. What a waste. I, and I, I'm not, it, this is just a funny story. I, I shared it before, but I remember there was a minister one time. His name's James Levesque. Some of you may have heard of him. And he just told a story one time. He got radically born again and like he was doing drugs and he was partying and he was living, he was living, living. You know, he was just going nuts, going crazy. And he got radically saved and he started taking a whole bunch of extra food and going under a bridge in Brooklyn and preaching to homeless people and having service. And he would do this without anybody telling him to. He just read in the Bible, feed the homeless. And he's like, all right, I'll take some bread out and I'll tell people about Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Somebody taking initiative, going out. So he's doing this and then he's like, you know what? I should start going to a church because I need to... uh, I need to make sure I'm doing this right. (laughs) Like he's like, maybe get validated or something. So he goes to a church and and he goes there and he's week after week, he's just noticing they sing songs. The minister preaches a message and everybody goes home and he's reading in his Bible. Lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, raise the dead. And he's going to church every week and he's like, for some reason, What I'm reading in here, I'm not seeing at the place that we're all told to go as Christians. I'm not seeing these miracles. I'm not seeing these things. So what he does is he goes up to the pastor one Sunday after church, and he says, do you guys have any classes on how to raise the dead? (laughs) And he wasn't, he was being sincere. And the pastor's like, oh, well, you know, the Bible says that, but, you know, we're living in a, a different time a little different time period you know we just you know we just we just we, we come here we sing the songs we love God but you know all that stuff that was just for a time period it doesn't happen anymore and he walked out of the church he walked outside and he screamed in the parking lot at the top of his lungs he said God I gave up drugs and sex for this he was just being genuine he's like I had it It was more fun living in the world than just coming playing church every week. And I'm here to tell you that God wants to take us on an adventure. We don't just read these stories and we're just trying to get by and have a night. Like, God wants you to part a Red Sea, figuratively. You know what I'm saying? Like, it might, it might be, hey, it might be, it might be the golf. I don't know. It's like, God might need you to do something crazy soon. But... (laughs) Jesus didn't have to part a sea. He just walked on it, though. We're supposed to be like him. So the thing is, is that I'm just saying that God is calling us into a deeper place, into a thing, and he wants to take you to a place where your trust is completely in him, but it's, it's about this journey of purity to see him more. Amen? So a few things as we get. If you guys could go to Genesis 3, I would say a few things while you're turning. As we were talking about prayer a second ago, especially with purity in the secret place, prayer that isn't initiated with worship will lack intimate substance. Prayer that isn't initiated with worship will lack intimate substance. You can even go as far to say that when you don't start prayer with adoring him, with worshiping him, your prayers will be filtered through your mind instead of surrendered through your heart. And I heard a minister say this a long time ago, and I can't remember who coined the phrase. Either way, it's good. I like, I've heard ministers say, if you say it from the pulpit and I like it, I'm stealing it. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember I heard somebody say this, and they said, if I only had 10 minutes to pray, I would take nine minutes to worship. And whoever said that was very wise. Because we don't realize the majority of our prayer life in the past, you know, as we've been growing and going in the Lord, sometimes our, our prayer, we don't realize how selfish we sound. Not, and God, 
God is such a good father and he wants to take care of all these needs, but you don't realize that most of the problems we have are actually more based around perception than what they really are. And worship changes your perception. Because what worship does is it allows you to see through his eyes instead of your own. Worship is what recalibrates your heart to align with eternity. It actually, worship, that's why it's so important we have times of, like really, I heard Michael Culliano say this at the conference, and he said that we really should get a lot more, he's, and it was funny, he, he really took a lot of heat because people would come to his services, and sometimes he would let the band go for like two hours, two, and like, but it was growing so much, like people were coming and coming, and then some people that were growing churches in the area were coming, like, you know, you can't keep doing this. They're going to stop coming because they're going to, you know, no. and, he, and he would say, excuse me, we're, we weren't singing to you. <laughs> right? Who are we supposed to be minister? And, and I, I brought this up last week that God's not unfair. He knows that we have tasks to get complete, but for some reason, whenever we finally make time for him, it's about how quick can we make this? Right? He's the king of the, you, your heart's beating because he put it there. And, and you're breathing air that he created. I think we can love on him. I think we could sing an extra song. I think, you know what I'm saying? And I know I'm, you know, being a little facetious, but just I want us to get to a place where this is what Gold Street Garden is going to be about. We're ministering to him. And the messages we minister, the things we talk about is how can we see him more? <laughs> it's like, how can we love him more? What, it's not, you know, it's just awesome. Like, what do we, this, it's, a, we, it's Jesus. <laughs> so it's good stuff. So Genesis 3. Isn't it amazing we're coming back to him? It's all about him. He's coming back for a bride, not a well-educated philosopher, like a well-educated theologian. Like Jesus isn't going to quiz you on theology when you come to heaven. You either loved him and knew him or you didn't. It's not, did you know all the eschatology? Did you know all this? Should we know that? Should we, should we, should we invest time in knowing the word? Yes, we should. Not, not discrediting it, but I am telling you that Jesus is about the heart. Sound theology means nothing if you don't know the sound of his voice. Sound doctrine means nothing if you don't know the sound of his voice. If doctrine, and you, you could even go as far to say, make sure God is your theology and theology isn't your God. Because how many people want to debate things in Christianity? The world, I, one of the things that actually really sickens me, it's like what the Lord has to really, I hate, like it, it really bothers me. Like when I'll see like a quick video somebody posted of somebody that has no Christian morals, whether it's some liberal or whatever it would be, somebody saying something along the token of, well, you know, they should really, that this, because this is what the Bible really says. And then they start muttering scripture that they just pull out and try to say that that's who Jesus is and get a whole bunch of people using scripture as a weapon of pride rather than the very instrument that is supposed to humble you to the very core. And getting to the place, this word is supposed to penetrate our hearts when we read it I, the prophet said that when i when isaiah said and jeremiah said as well his word makes me tremble like handling the word of god it's so precious and yet sometimes we we we, we we're, we're too familiar with access to it instead of being thankful for the access we have to it. Amen? So in Genesis 3, I like to start in 
I always like to go back to the garden when I'm teaching on anything. Dr. Miles Monroe, a very wise man, highly recommend his, his teaching. He passed away a few years ago, tragically, but an amazing man of God. He, he always said that Genesis 1 through 2 is God's perfection, and Genesis 3 to Revelation is God's plan back to perfection. And I just love that. It's such a great way to understand. If you want to see God's will, his perfection is Genesis 1 through 2, the way that the garden was. And it's so funny that our minds, isn't it? Our minds view productivity as great labor, right? Like productivity means getting a lot done in a day. When God's idea of productivity is a really good conversation. You know, I can prove that. He created the world in a conversation. Our idea of productivity is manual labor. God's really, his idea of productivity is a good conversation. That's why he wants you in the secret place. Because he can change your life with a really good conversation. He wants to talk with you. He wants to create something in your heart. Because your heart is now the Garden of Eden. And he wants to create it. And your, what was Adam's job is to tend to the garden. So we look after it, he creates in it. He'll give you words to speak over your life. I, I, was, I shared with our leadership over the weekend, the Lord really put it on my heart. I was driving down the street. I was actually just driving over the Courtney Campbell over here. And the Lord put it on my heart that I'm going after Jesus. I'm loving Jesus. Everything's going really good. And I just felt a spirit of discouragement enter my vehicle. Like, I, I had no reason to be discouraged. And I just, I don't, has anybody been there before where actually everything's going really good and for some reason you just feel icky or like feel like unmotivated? That's a spirit. That's not normal. But people think it is. Like, I'm just having a, I'm just having a bad day. It's like, but that's what happens if you don't know the spiritual nature of things. That what, what, what actually happens is a spirit will see that you are going after things and it'll just try to creep in. See if it can like land a little Eeyore on your shoulder. Ooh, you know, it's like, and like, you know, so it's like <laughs> spirit of discouragement. So it's like what, what happens is I immediately started loving on him. And what I did is I started reminding myself of all the things that I know God's called me to do. And when I started speaking them out loud, any discouragement like vanished away. I was like, Lord, you've called me to be a mighty man of God. You've called me to be a husband. You've called me to be a father so that I can learn what it is to be be in, in a marriage relationship with you through my wife. And I was like, I'm learning to be a father so I can learn your attributes and share them with my daughter. Lord, you've called me to be a pastor. Lord, we're starting a church in Clearwater. And I just started speaking all this stuff over my life. And that's the Lord has spoken words to you and they're weapons that you use to crack him over side the head when he tries to come at you. He will try to discourage you. He's going to try to come at you every chance he gets. When did he come after Jesus? He waited until like the last day when, when Jesus had an eight and 40 days. Like he waited till the end because the devil knows if I come at you when you're weak, he, he's such a scum. Like he's going to, he's, he's like, he's coming. He knows when to come at you. But we know how to respond, right? How do we respond? You know, I, you know, really, there is, if you're talking to the devil, you already made a mistake. You don't talk to him, you just tell him. You don't, there's no conversation. How do you know if the devil's lying? If he opens his mouth. You don't need to even listen to it, entertain. So in Genesis 3, it, this might actually end up being like a 10 week series because I haven't got anywhere, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Hey, it's all about the heart. It's all about Jesus. Let's go after. So Genesis 3, let's read this. Now the serpent in verse 1 was more cunning 
than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall eat of every tree of the garden? So it's questioning what God has, has spoken. And isn't the devil, he once again, just he doesn't ask Adam because Adam heard directly. He asked Eve because Eve heard from Adam. So the devil is preying on the weak in this situation, also waiting for Eve to be alone. So Eve, the devil waited for Eve to be isolated in the game of telephone. Because has anybody played telephone before? If I whispered something in, in your ear, you, if, when we got to the back of the room, it would be something completely different. And the devil knows that. He knows that people hear things and hear things, and that's why it's so important. You know his voice, and your, your greatest conviction isn't just what you've heard a minister say, but you've heard it from him. You've read it. You've heard it in the throne room. So, and the woman said to the serpent, serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely, or you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There's so much here, so many angles we could go, but I want to keep going. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. This is a sad moment. This is an extremely sad moment. It, it's... it's it's, it's so important we, we really get. Did you know that Jesus only cursed one thing, his whole earthly ministry? Does anybody know what he cursed? Fig tree. That's how, that's how bad this rubbed God, that the only thing he cursed would be a fig tree because the fig tree was what would remind him of his children finding ways to hide from him instead of be with him. Only thing he cursed. Now, here's the thing. After they covered themselves and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Such a sad moment because some, some of us have a, a, a wrong perception of sin. Did you know that sin didn't change the way God saw you? Sin changed the way you saw God. That's important to see because so many times we think that sin is the problem. Sin, if sin itself isn't the biggest problem. The problem is what sin caused man to feel towards God. Sin caused a nature in man's heart to feel inferior in his presence, to feel like they couldn't, they didn't desire to be there anymore. Remember when, if, if you're not familiar, that when Jesus first met Peter, that soon as God's glory was manifest. Peter immediately said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Because, and that, that breaks God's heart that that's our response. And there's a story about Zacchaeus in, in Luke chapter 19. It's this small tax collector. It's this, this small guy. And he wanted to see Jesus. He heard Jesus was coming. It's this small man. And he hears Jesus is coming, and there's all these crowds, and he can't see. So you know what he does? He climbs a tree. Now, to some of us, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but you have to understand, if he is a, a rich man, well-established in a city, and he starts climbing a tree just to see a dude, that looks pretty undignified. That, 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 would, that would mean that something touched 
Zacchaeus' heart about this man. And he, he's actually an evil person in a lot of people's eyes because he takes more money than he should as a tax collector. He, he tells the people what they, they should give, but then he adds some so that he can take, put some in his pocket. So he's stealing from people. But he wants to see this man, Jesus. And when he finally gets up there and he sees Jesus, out of this whole crowd, Jesus yells and says, Zacchaeus! To our knowledge, they've never met before. But it doesn't matter, because they have. Jesus knew him from the, before the foundation of the world. He knew him in his mother's womb. He calls him out, and you better believe that had to stir him up. He probably almost fell out of the tree. He's probably like, whoa, like, <laughs> he knew my name. And he's like, Zacchaeus, we're going to your house today. <laughs> it's like, Zacchaeus is like, wow. But what was he doing? He was seeking, and the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. And he, even in his position, he climbs this tree because he wants to see. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Jesus calls him down, goes to his house, and Zacchaeus is like, Lord, I'm going to give back fourfold what people stole. I'm going to give back all these things. Jesus never once told him he had to do any of that. And in the chapter before, he had an encounter with a rich young ruler. And Jesus told him he had to do something because the man was trying to interrogate his way into, you know, uh, an inheritance. But Zacchaeus just wanted God. He just wanted the man Jesus. He didn't want any answers or anything. He just wanted to see him, goes to his house. And the reason I bring that story up is because you know how that little story ends? Jesus says this, for this reason, the son of man came to seek that which was lost. Not who, what was lost. Why would he bring this up right there? Because what Adam lost in the garden was the, the desire to seek God because the sin nature hindered him from wanting to see him. But then when Jesus sees this man climb a tree who's full of sin, full of all these, these things going on, but says, I just want to see this man. I just want to see this man. Jesus says, I'm coming to your house. Then the, the guy wants to give all this stuff back and pay. And, you know, who knows? He probably blessed Jesus' ministry and all these different things. And then Jesus said, this is why I came. Jesus could have said that. When he was, you know, on the cross, he could have found a more opportune time to say, this is why I came, <laughs> you know, like Jesus came to do amazing things. But he used this man to say, this is why the son of man came to restore the heart of man to seek me for no other reason than to be with me. That changes it. It changes. It's a game changer. I'm not coming into your presence, God, because I need something. I'm coming because you are worthy and you created me to have fellowship with you. And I'm most alive when I'm in love. I'm, I'm my, I am the best dom when I am in love with with him. When I'm in love with things that he does, I'm not at my best. When I'm in love with the things around him, I'm, I'm not at my best. I'm on shaky ground. But when I love him because he's worthy, all the stuff just happens. Prosperity happens. Healing happens without having to teach hours upon hours upon giving and all these different things. All of a sudden, you're just in his presence and everything you need. Because what does it say? In his presence is the fullness of joy. And, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. But then even Jesus came. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these things will be added unto. Does he say, seek first and then? He doesn't even give you a then. Because there's only one thing to seek. There's only one thing to seek. 
I love my family the best when he's first on my, in my heart. I actually, some of you guys know that when I teach, I actually, I don't like when people say God first, family second, ministry work third. I, I understand the heart behind it, but God is not a category. Amen. It's not God first, and then I'll do everything else. It's God first, God and family second. God and work third. God is not a category. He is everything. And any category in your life he is not a part of is destined to fail. It's, it's destined to fail. People that put their family first think they're doing a justice when it's actually the most lethal thing you could do. I, I like to give the example that if there was a single file line, whoever is in front of the line, if there were an attack, like you just, just say just being funny, like somebody threw a water balloon at a single file line, whoever's in front would get hit first. So if I put my family first and an attack of the enemy comes, God cannot, God won't cannot, he does not have the authority to take the brunt of that attack because family is before him. It's not, it's not his doing. It's just the fact that that's how it works. He has to be first and all. It's not being unfair. It's actually the greatest deal. But our minds try to find ways to say, well, you know, I'm just not ready for this God thing right now. I, I was there. I wanted to snort another line. I wanted to party a little longer before I finally said, I, I remember there was nights I was, I was partying with my friends, had the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my heart, <laughs> stoned, whatever. And I would just be like, I would be with my friends and I'd be like, guys, the sky looks a little weird tonight. I think Jesus is coming. Grab my hand. That's how I, that, I had the conviction. I couldn't even enjoy getting high anymore because all I could think about is he's coming back. Do you know what it says when you read Timothy and Titus, when you read these letters? It actually says that knowing that he's coming back should be enough motivation for you to want to live pure. If, he could, if, if he's coming back at any moment, why would you... Why would you want to risk everything for temporary pleasure when eternal pleasure is going to be in another blink? And heaven on earth is a promise. We can have that right now. In fact, it's our mandate is to bring heaven to earth. But I, th there is nothing that is that you would, there is nothing that compares to knowing eternal security. There's nothing. Because we all know that there's probably people in this room that we know that have gone on, that have passed over, and they were never religious, never spiritual, never talked about God, but when they got to the end, it's, it's funny how people perk up a little bit. Like, hey, what does happen after this? You know, we don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. But it's only uncomfortable if you don't know life. Because John 17, 3 says to know him is eternal life. We're actually already, we, we were all created to be eternal beings. It's just our will decides a fate that God never wanted God never made hell for any human being. Hell was just, death was just designed for Satan and his fallen angels. But our will, I want it my way. I'm going to live how I want right now and do what I want. That's not a game you want to play. Your soul is so much more valuable than a moment of doing what you want. And we've all had moments, and isn't it amazing what the Lord has done in our lives? Couldn't we all go around the room and say, I would even be dead right now? Is there anybody that would be dead if it wasn't for, that's amazing. That's amazing. You want to touch a miracle? Just grab their hand. Amen? 
So, three things in closing. <laughs> You're like laughing, Joe. He's like, that means we're going to be here for a while. No. Hey, Paul would preach till people fell out of the window. So, they would fall asleep. They would go. So, you guys got nice comfy chairs, so you'll be all right. <laughs> it's so funny. That was the thing I was going to say earlier about Michael Kulianos, too, is when they would sing in services and they would sing, do you, do you realize when we get to heaven, you know, they've been singing the same song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. They just keep singing it over and over again. How many, let's all be real. How many people were tired of how great is our God? Tired, you know, like, come on. Chris Tomlin, do you sing anything else, bro? <laughs> and then good, good father, it's like, okay, he's good. You know what I'm saying? How quickly we get bored with songs and things when the angels don't even know what else to sing. Because every time they see him, they're not thinking about a set list. They're thinking he's worthy. Not, and, and. When we get to heaven, we have to get so used to worshiping because that's all we're going to do. Like, if you get bored of it now, whoa, <laughs> try eternity. He's that worthy. He's that good. And, like, you know, it's like, I think, you know, I think, I think the worship went a little too long. I think there needs to be more preaching. There's no preaching in heaven. It's just worship. It's because everything you need to know is in beholding him. If you behold him a little longer, you will learn more by staying in that moment than you would from the most educated theologian vomiting a whole bunch of facts at you. I was telling the, the class even last night, like, I have listened to ministers that know geography about you know, Dr. Coffin, a couple of us, they're like, there's this one teacher at the school that, like, he, he knows everything. Like, it's almost like he is a walking biblical encyclopedia. Like, it just, like there was times I would be in class, and he would, he would talk for 15 minutes, and then he would say, that was Mark chapter 14. Like, he would literally just quote, like, a whole chapter of, a bi of the Bible without missing a beat. Like, he would even add the punctuation. He's like, there's a comma there. And he's just like this. And he would know all this geography, and it's amazing, but I, I told everybody that that doesn't change anyone's life. Knowing all of that, the only thing that changes you is if he's real to you and he means everything. That's the only thing that will change you. And when I get up and minister, I do. I want to give you guys something that you can take and run with in your life, but my greatest desire is that when I speak, there would be a weight on my voice called the anointing. And this weight that's on my voice is the very presence of Jesus. And that I pray that when I speak, that people would, would feel the presence of the living God, that they wouldn't be entertained by a sermon, they wouldn't be enamored with a sermon, but that they would literally sense the presence of God that there was just something different about him when he spoke about God. Because that's what changed my life. I remember being in Maryland and running from the things of God and having a mom pray for me, just doing drugs all the time. And I remember the youth pastor would get up and he would preach on hell. Like out of, you know, and it, like he would preach on hell. And uh, some people be like, you know, it's, it's better to, you know, only teach on love. But it actually, it impacted me. I ran to the altar and I said, I heard an atheist say this once. He said that, he said, an atheist said this. He said, the reason I don't believe that there's a God, because if there was a place as real as hell, I would crawl across broken glass to tell my family about it. Talk about sobering. Atheists preaching the gospel better than most preachers. Hell is real. You might not have an area code, but it's real. And I say that because when this, I remember this man preaching, 
And when he preached about hell, it wasn't he was just warning me. He was, he was telling me that some man named Jesus made a way that not only do you not have to go there, but you can live every day and talk to God. I grew up Catholic, and I, I thought that the only time I could even talk to God is if I talked to a priest first, and then I said a couple prayers right and things like that. I didn't know I could even talk to him, and, but there was somebody that was convicted by the reality of God and spoke him into a room, and I ran to an altar. Amen? And that's my desire, is I want us to be so convinced of his reality that when we go out to eat, we pull up an extra chair and say, Jesus is with us. Like, I know it seems kooky, but it's just like, I want to get to a place where we're just, that's, that's just norm. It's just things that just seem crazy are not crazy because he's that real. Amen. You guys feel the presence of the Lord here? He's, he's so good. Hallelujah. Whatever is pure can be traced back to his presence. Even a newborn baby. Isn't it so amazing that we could be so oblivious that that newborn baby just came from glory? That that newborn baby has the signature of heaven all over it. When somebody gives their life to the Lord, just got radically saved. Isn't it so amazing that when you talk to them, that it's like every word they say is drenched in heaven. It's like, that's what I desire. I desire that, that whatever is pure can be traced back to glory. And that's why it's so important that we guard our hearts, as Proverbs 4 tells us, with all diligence. We guard it because... We want this to be so pure that when people conversate with us, that our conversation leads them to the presence. When I talk about Jesus, I don't want to talk about what I believe in. I want to talk about the love of my life. When somebody asks you what Jesus means, who he means to you, what is your response? Can you respond? What does he mean to me? That's why the Lord probably needed me to start a church so I could talk about it over and over and over and over and over again. He's that good. Amen. So we're not going to get to what I need to say, and, that, and it's, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. This is perfect. This is perfect. I want to take communion. Amen. And I, I do feel like we're going we're gonna to stay here in a sense of the next. What I, I want you guys to know that we're not going to be the church. that's like we're doing a series on, you know, power or, you know, it's like it's, it's not we're, it's not going to be. We're not going to, you know, make it this huge hoorah thing on a series. Whenever the Lord puts on my heart, we're just going to talk about it. Until we feel release to go a different direction. And I just want you, just so you know, so the Lord has put it in our heart, purity of heart, so we're going to ride this wave because in this wave, when we're obedient to what he says, we're going to see him, right? If, if in two weeks from now he says, you know, teach on healing, we will, we will go down that route and we will, we will do it together in faith and watch him just reveal himself. I really believe that in these services that we are going to see people get out of wheelchairs. Who can I, come on, we gotta, I believe that we will see people that have been diagnosed with incurable diseases or whatever, that we will get doctor reports put in our hands saying that they are healed. Amen? I am done with just going through the motions and just things like that. Like, we have to see heaven come to earth. I can't get it out of, out of me, and I'm so thankful for it because this is what it's all about, amen? Last thing, right before we go to communion, if you go to Luke chapter 17, I just really feel this on my, 
my heart to share. It was something that kind of came up. Luke 17. This is, uh, if you go to verse 11, it's the story of uh, the ten lepers that were cleansed. I just want to read this story real quick because it, it has so much to do with purity and where we're at. <laughs> so, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then he entered a certain village. There met him ten men who were lepers who stood far off, afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So isn't it amazing that when people have problems, everybody speaks up? Your hand in healing out? I'll be there. You know, it's... Everybody's loud when they have a need. But when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. Isn't that amazing? That even all they're doing is they have a need. And Jesus, Jesus being on the earth, he sees his children in hurt. And he just wants them healed. But what were you talking about? Why? Why does God do it? Why does he do it? He does. It's, he's trying to lure us in a way to be with him in intimacy. So when a breakthrough comes through in your life, the breakthrough was not just to get you to shout hallelujah. The breakthrough was actually an invitation to go deeper into intimacy. Isn't that awesome? That if we would, if every day when we were thankful, we would use instead of just the things that we see that we have need, but we looked at all the things we were thankful for, in that thanksgiving, we would go to a new level of intimacy. Just thinking about your family, thinking about the house that you have or the car that you have, the things, it's, it's when you start celebrating what God has done in your life that, that the, the flame of intimacy is kindled. Because we enter his courts with what? Thanksgiving and praise. So when you thank him, you are thanking your way into intimacy. You're thanking your way into a deeper revelation of who he is. Amen. So what happens is right after that, he fell down on his, or uh, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And then verse 15, it says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Out of ten, only one came and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? So did you notice that Jesus could have just, he, could, he didn't have to make a deal about it, right? He could have just said, oh, thank you for coming back. But he, he, he spoke up and said, were there not ten? You know what that shows me is it bothers him. It bothers him. And were there not ten? But where are the nine? Where there not any who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. So the, all I want to say in closing in that, as we're talking about the pure in heart going after, is the fact that ten got healed, but only one learnt something about his character. And the way that he learned was by coming back and giving glory. When we come to give God glory, what happens is God, it becomes the place where God can teach us. Worship is actually where God gives his greatest lessons of his character. When you come back and you just, he didn't come back because he needed another healing. Do you see that? His only reason for coming back was because I want to worship this man. He had no other need. And Jesus said, he told, the other ones were not told they were whole. They were told they, were, they, they had a word and got healed. But only this man knew what wholeness was. He knew. And because of that, going forward, he knows that every time I give glory to God, I'm going to learn something more about him. Know who he is. Amen. 
I believe I'm looking at a lot of believers and it's family in here, but I made a vow to God that I would never preach the gospel without giving an invitation. If you're in this place and say, say you know things about God and you've even gone to church or say you don't wherever you're at. As I was talking tonight, I believe God is calling people home if you're in this place and you do not know Jesus as Lord, and that means that if you were, if today was the last day and you had to stand before him, the only thing that makes you worthy is what we just talked about. It's accepting him as the Lord of your life, as the sacrifice that you could not give. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus and you want to know him intimately and guarantee the fact that that you know you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, and that he is the Lord of your life. I just, everybody's eyes are closed. If you're in this place and there's any doubt in your heart, this is not a place to be ashamed. Just lift your hand if that's you. If you're in this place and you do not know him as Lord, do not leave here wondering. Do not leave here thinking, I'll, I'll get it right sometime. You're with people that are want to cheer with you, that want to help you know him more. If you're in this place, just raise your hand. Hallelujah. I believe we're looking at family, but I just, as a minister, and my love for the Lord, I don't ever want to not give that invitation. Last thing in closing, if you're in this place, and we didn't even get to some of the stuff that I know the Lord is going to take us on an amazing journey through, if you're in this place, and that verse has just been ringing in your heart all night, Matthew 5, 8, that the pure in heart shall see their God. We don't have to make a big spectacle tonight. I just really feel it in my heart that if you're in this place tonight, I always want to give this opportunity for people to step out in faith where you're at. If you're in this place and this message was just intricately for you and you know that there's areas in your life that have not been pure, that even as the words were going forth tonight, the Lord started putting his finger on certain things with everybody's eyes closed. I just want you to raise your hand, and I just, hallelujah, there's hands going up everywhere. Praise God. God's doing the work in people's hearts. It's amazing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I want us to do right now is, is if everybody could stand. And I do want to say the reason we get people to raise their hand, the reason we do it is because it's an act of faith on your own end. It's you saying, yes, Lord. And I want to give you that opportunity to do that, to say yes, Lord, to whatever it would be. So what I want to do is I want to say a prayer corporately together, and you're just going to repeat it after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are my everything. Lord, forgive me for making things about so many other things than you. Lord, purify me. Get down into the areas of my heart that need renewal, that need change. I surrender myself to you as a living sacrifice. I thank you that you are a good father and you will walk me through this process and I will see you more clearly every day, every new day, I will see you clearer, greater, bigger. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Can we just celebrate that right now? We believe that. Just, just praise him. Father, we thank you. We thank you for doing the work in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice that they are going to see you in greater measure. They are going to go after you. I thank you that you're taking us on the journey of purity. 
it's not too much of a sacrifice to say no to the world. It's an honor to say no. And to say yes to you. When we say yes to you, we're saying no to everything else. Thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're here every Tuesday, and we're going to be going after it hard. We love you all so much. God bless.